want to welcome everyone to the Saturday portion of our program. We've got a full day today that's going up until about 5.30 today. We're going to start out with a panel with um, Brian, Joe, and Bill. I don't think we need any more introduction. Everyone's become familiar with them over the last couple of days and obviously knows them. So that's our first panel. A couple of um, housekeeping things I just wanted to talk about. We are going to have lunch inside today because of the weather again. So it's going to be in the Valley of the Ballroom DE, which is just straight across from here. Also, the um, Sproing and React, you might have seen their products in a couple of the different rooms. They are now out in the foyer today, and feel free to go and check out their um, interesting products and see what they're doing out there. So, um, you know. And then the program today at 10 o'clock after this first panel, we have the Business of Baseball Analytics will be in this room, and then throughout the day later on, it will be in the Deer Valley room where we'll be having a number of things going on at once. Run you through the schedule real quick. At 11 o'clock in this room, Vince Gennaro is going to be doing his presentation, the big data approach to baseball analytics. Then we'll be giving out another um, analytics award. Um, following lunch, we have a player development panel in this room. We also have a player agent panel in this room. And toward the end of the day, the Pepperdine Law School, which won the um, graduate division, they're going to be doing their presentation, and then we'll follow it up with some closing remarks, and that will be the end of the second annual Sabre Analytics Conference. So welcome again, and now I'm going to turn it over to Brian. true we, we get used to being here already in the last couple of days so we're just kind of um, you know here and you get used to just being in the presence of, of all the people that are here and um, you know you have to stop yourself and I had to stop myself even last night as I was thinking the same thing as Mark is thinking that you know Bob I even you know write an introduction and, and that sort of thing and I think you have to sometimes stop and realize where you are and treasure this moment as I thought last night I had the chance to talk to, to Bill and, and Joe on a panel, what, what an opportunity. And, and I don't want to pass up on that opportunity and try to mine the most that I can out of brilliant minds for everybody that's here. This is strange. Someone should do a study. Oh, this room is so different. It's flat earth, right? Panoramic. What's the, is this more cohesive to creative thought or, or less, Bill? What do you think when it's flattened out this way? People like filter into the room and seek, right, the, the level and go out wide. What type of person goes out wide? What per, type of person sits right here? Well, I know these guys sit right here all the time, but it's interesting. <clears throat> um, I know you have to treasure where you are and, and, and realize the time and place because we'll be looking back on this in a few weeks and say, wow, I heard this and I sat there and I just walked right up to, you know, you know to Jonah Carey and, and Rob Nyer and just had a conversation with him, uh, let alone, you know, Bill and Joe. And it's, it's ridiculous. I texted my son last night. I said, Bill James just mentioned me in his speech and is debunking my theories right now. Like, what an honor. <laughs> I was, <clears throat> the fact that he would, you know, even, he would even take the time to shoot down some of my thoughts, which I, I, I do take a few issues, sir, in, uh, in a few moments. Anyway, I'll, just, I'll, I'll question you, but let me bring them up right now. First, my thanks to, to Vince Gennaro <clears throat> and Mark Appleman. It's my first Sabre function. I've been very remiss. I should be a much better card-carrying member of... Uh, of the organization in the future, and I will be. But let's hear it for Vince and Mark, just for putting on a great <laughs> event. <laughs> these, th these things are difficult, and they don't run smoothly on their own. So thank you to, to, to both of you, and for, for making me get out here, too, and for paving the way. Uh, I joked with Joe Posnanski on Thursday, saying, hey, because uh, I looked at uh, what uh, the guys had put together on the, uh, you know, on the schedule. And I said, hey, we're, uh, we're on an analytics super panel with Bill James. And uh, I said, you know, two guys on the street who have never heard of baseball and Bill James would definitely qualify as an analytics super panel. Um, so we're here as an analytics super panel uh, either way, uh, but Bill is here, so we're safe. Uh, and let me just bring him in right now. A, a writer who is, I, I just want to say, you know, consistently comes up with fascinating ideas and questions. As, um, as Vince mentioned yesterday and as Bill mentioned, that coming up with the, the questions, uh, that's where it's at. Uh, and, and he answers them, and this is the highest compliment to a baseball writer in a Jamesian fashion. Uh, I, I owe, and I can't believe my luck when I see that, when I see uh, uh, one of his columns, 
um, and I'm scrolling down just to see how much he wrote and just how far he geeked out on a Hall of Fame column. I'll see the length and I'll go, wow, he got to, to Dale Murphy and he got to this guy, wow, and I dig into it. So let's bring him in, uh, NBCSports.com now, we'll all follow him there, Joe Posnanski. And again, quite simply, uh, one of the most influential thinkers in the history of baseball, it needs to be said. And the question was put to him yesterday, and I'll answer it. Of course he should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame, inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's terrific to have him here and just to be able to interact where he's on a panel where you can just ask a question and shoot something out here. It's a great opportunity. Uh, he's able to sign autographs and sign books for people. It's, it's terrific to have him here, and I hope he's out here doing these sorts of things and being uh, as accessible because it's not easy to do. Um, his independent thought you know, has been and continues to be an inspiration, and he should know that. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill James. All right, let's start it off. Um, war is at the forefront now. Bill, where are you with war win shares? And, and what are your thoughts as, as just anything as far as boiling things down to one number? Closer, maybe? There we go. The, uh, uh, there's a risk involved in boiling anything down to, to one number because things always get left out. The, uh, but I'm getting more comfortable with it, uh, in part because analytics is just a lot more sophisticated than it used to be, and the things that get left out are in some way easier to pull out. Where, where are wind shares, uh, Bill? I mean, as far as what, what are your thoughts? Do you, do you still like doing it, uh, getting down to wind shares? Or? The, uh, well, at the time that I wrote the book of wind chairs, I thought I was done with this line of analytical thought, and I thought I had pushed it as far as I... About two years later, I began to see flaws in the concept that uh, uh, I wished I'd dealt with. And so I'm working on... I'm 95% done with wind chairs and lost shares. And what I'll do with wind chairs and lost shares is then combine them into, uh, into one number, which I think I'll call levels of value, evalu levels of value uh, elevated, make love, not war. The, um, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, the, uh, but anyway, I, I, I'm going to come out within a couple of years with a system of win shares and loss shares and then you can state value in one number based on that. Joe, where are you on, on all this one number? Well, I, I think that there's so many advantages to having one number. I mean, it doesn't have to be the end of where you go, but if you wanted to just look and see who are the best 50 players of the last 50 years, and you just wanted to just go by war, that's probably going to give you pretty close to the best 50 players over the last 50 years. I mean, it, there's, there's going to be some variance, obviously, but you're at least getting a starting point. And then you can start really doing the work. I mean, I don't like using war in a way to say, okay, this guy has a had a 6.4 war last year, and this guy had a 6.2 war last year, so this guy was better. I don't, I don't think it, it comes down to that, but I think it's a great starting point. I use it all the time to try to just kind of narrow lists and, and get definitions, and, and uh, I, think it's, I think it's very good. Yeah, yesterday, I, I couldn't have watching, um, watching the U.S. versus Mexico. I, I walk in and um, walk in with Dave Cameron, and the first thing I see, I look up and I see, <laughs> I see, uh, Rollins lead off, Brandon Phillips second. And I'm, I'm thinking, there's Joe Maurer, right, with a 416 on base last year. There's David Wright with a 391 on base last year. And here's United States baseball batting the speedy shortstop lead off and the gritty bat control second baseman <laughs> second. Is this as far as we've gone, Bill? I mean, <laughs> where, what are we doing? This is United States baseball with these guys 100 points less in on base batting first and second. Yeah. It was a, quite a lineup. The, uh, and I think, there's, I think there's a sense that, uh, I think there was a sense with the team that there was, Giancarlo Stanton was hitting seventh, right? The, uh, and uh, I think there was a sense that there was so much talent on this lineup that it didn't really matter. Uh, and the truth is it doesn't matter that much, but it still irritates you that they get the little things wrong. The, uh, but but uh, uh, yeah, it's probably not why they lost. <laughs> How much, uh, oh, your thoughts on that, Joe, first, on, on seeing that. Does that uh, I, get your attention? Sure it does, sure. I, you know, I, I think it's, it's something, um, when, when I was on the panel last week at Sloan, um, 
uh, at some point, one of the people on the panel said something to the effect of, well, we're at the point now where everybody in baseball understands that on base percentage is the, the most important, you know, whatever. I don't think that's true. I don't, and, and that's not just because I'm following the Royals. I, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I just don't think that's true in general. I think people value on base percentage very differently throughout baseball. And, and, and I think that a lot of the things that maybe in a, a certain room or a certain group is, is widely accepted is not necessarily. I, I still think, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of talk, for instance, when Andre Dawson, when he was up for the Hall of Fame, there was a lot of talk about his low, low on base percentage. And there was a strong feeling, well, but at that time, nobody cared about on base percentage. His job was not to get on base. His job was to drive in runs or whatever, which I don't entirely buy. But even if you do, I don't think it's that different now. I still think there are managers that tell you your job is not to get on base. Your job is to drive in runs. So I, I don't know that, that within the game that there's any widely accepted form on, on a lot of these things. And, and I think that, you know, there are a lot of people that would hit the speedy shortstop first and the, and the, and the bat handling second baseman second. The, the, tr the traditions of learning the game for players and managers are still very different than the traditions of learning the game for fans. So, uh, and the, the, to a degree, there's been a, di a divergence rather than a convergence because of the uh, research that people do, that, that it's like there are two tracks of learning the game now. So. Do you think that changes with guys in the dugout with iPads going in to watch their video? More and more guys are operating where that you can see uh, the trends and what they have and what they want and what the statistics, what statistics they're supposed to hit. Does eventually that catch up? No. 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 Really? I don't think so, no. <laughs> no, I, well, here, here's the thing, and, and, and I don't think this should be underplayed. Um, if you're, there, there have been fabulous studies done about how you really, there is no such thing in general as a hot streak, right? That if, because you've been hitting well the last three days, that doesn't mean that your, your chances of hitting well today is any better than it would have been. I mean, that there, there have been, you know, fabulous studies, basketball starting and then baseball as well. You cannot tell a player on a hot streak that that's true, right? Because the emotions that they are feeling of going out there, oh, the ball looks like a grapefruit and it's coming in slow and I'm whacking it, you know, I'm just everything I'm hitting is hitting hard. You cannot tell that person that doesn't exist, no matter how many good stats you have, because they are going to believe what they feel and what they see and what they, 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 they you know. So I, I don't think that, that this is ever going to completely change. I don't think anybody in a dugout is ever going to, if, you, if I, there's no number you could show Dusty Baker that is gonna tell him that his number three hitter should take a walk on a bad pitch rather than swing the bat and get the guy in. That's, that's just an emotional feeling and I think it's, I don't think that's gonna change. But as players now are aware of their pitches per plate appearance, right? And, and to go back to a time, Bill, where a guy literally who is batting average was the batting champion, right? right? If that's what you were shooting for, you're incentivized to do that. Whatever you are incentivized to do, you will do, correct? Or try to do. Right. But there's still, there's still a whole world of incentives for pitchers' wins and, and uh, uh, saves and traditional stats. And uh, I think if, if a player won the Triple Crown now, he'd probably still win the MVP. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy talk that's, that, uh, that's, that's not going to happen you don't have to do that um, no, but Matt Cain got paid and I know when Matt Cain got his contract someone said boy with a guy you know, I was on a radio show and someone said do you ever think a guy with a losing record would get a hundred million and I said I had no idea he had a losing record right. or that I, and I didn't have I don't even know what his win-loss record is but, yeah. but and the that, Giants paid him but that was traditional stats too 200 innings a, a year I mean it was still I don't think they looked at Matt Cain because I mean it, you know the, one of the one of the more interesting elements of Matt Cain has been that his, his, his fielding independent uh, pitching numbers have been low because he's, you know, for whatever reason, or, or high rather. And uh, um, so it's not like they've looked at him analytically and said, oh, you know, Matt Cain. They, they paid him because he's a 200 inning pitcher and a bulldog and, and all of those sorts of things. But it's taking us out of that, Joe. If you go back to uh, uh, 1963, uh, I actually do go back to 1963, <laughs> but uh, uh, Jim Bunning had a similar year. He pitched a lot of innings. He had a great strikeout to walk ratio, as he always did, but he had a, a losing record, and, and the Tigers traded him for a not very good outfielder. Uh, 
because the, you know they thought, well, you know, he's, it just doesn't doesn't come through in those critical moments. And he was, he was he was every bit as good as Matt King. Sure. Well, but but was there a different feeling then about innings uh, among starters because every starter threw bunches of innings, or they got discarded? Right. But I think. But that's true. I mean, I'm sure. That, I think it's changed. I mean, and and I think it is going to continue to change, but very, very, very incrementally. I don't think it's going to be. We're, I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where it's going to be, you know, specifically data driven. I think I disagree with that. Um, I, I think guys now, uh, the new wave of the 22, 23 year old guy who is used to having one of these in front of him that is searching for more and more information. Because it's really just, you know, the, the pitch FX and the, the heat maps and everything. You're, it's just, it's, um, I, they're more interested in it than I am, actually, where they're, it's a scouting thing. And I think as you look more and you want to see, hey, where do I rank? Where do I rank? Hey, what are the numbers? Where, what should we shoot for? I think you'll get more guys like Brandon McCarthy will, that will think, what are my numbers and how do I go about hitting them? I would, I would argue that, that there's as much uh, uh, new, new misinformation, as, uh, as many new fallacies that build up from that type of information as there, as there is a, an erosion of the old ones. The uh, 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 people still believe in the, the hot hitter and, and, the, uh, and looking at the game through in, in those new ways that you mentioned is very much amenable to a, a whole line of new of new fallacies, and the new ones will develop at the same at the same rate the old ones deteriorate. Hmm. Okay. Did my um, dreams of a knuckleball academy take a hit yesterday with R.A. Dickey getting roughed up on an international stage? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we just wait until Stephen Wright gets ready. And <laughs> I, I, and, 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 you know, Bill, I thought Bill made some really good points. I still think there should be a baseball uh, knuckleball academy. I, I think some of those things that Bill talked about that are incrementally challenging would not be as challenging if they were doing it in an enclosed environment where you had specialist catchers and specialist coaches and all of that. I don't know how that works within the confines of baseball. Like, I don't know that one team would be able to do a baseball academy uh, for knuckleballers. But I think there should be a school, uh, a knuckleball school. I, I just, and especially because you can, you know, you don't have to be 23 uh, to peak as a knuckleballer, 25. I mean, you can peak as a knuckleballer later. So I do wonder if, like, you know, there's scouting schools, the umpire schools, why there isn't a knuckleball school. Well, how many guys are there in the room who think they could be a major league knuckleball pitcher? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I've always believed that. I've <laughs> always believed that. Wouldn't you train, Bill, uh, catchers, though, too? So there wouldn't be enough catchers. Right. Really, if you had it in the cat, if you institutionalized it, you'd have catchers. Well, Can I, think, you? I think that may be the way, the way to do it, right? I think, I think that might actually happen, uh, that, uh, that you overcome all of those little problems by not trying. I think all the problems I was describing are the things that happen when you're trying to uh, uh, develop a pitcher in a minor league setting. So it might be that you just have to say, okay, we can't use the minor league setting to develop these pitchers, so we have to do something entirely different. Right. And a lot of ways, the uh, uh, minor league, the minor league development system is sort of archaic anyway. So. How so? Well, uh, a lot of time and effort is, is devoted to travel, bus rides, and, and uh, the, uh, it, you could, one could certainly develop the same amount of talent a lot more economically efficiently if every team wasn't trying to develop everything independently. I've, I've always believed that the Kansas City Royals Baseball Academy was a brilliant idea mm -hmm. that that didn't uh, that didn't fail on its own, but also could be you know I mean in some ways it is being used in in the Dominican and, and in Venezuela and some of these other academies. But I think that concept of taking players and and just infusing them with 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 constant you know instruction, constant coaching uh, on and off the field, teaching them how to be baseball players. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways that would be pretty effective, a pretty effective way of, of raising players. Yeah, no, it, it succeeded and, was, and the, and the old-line old baseball profession has killed it anyway. Yeah. So what's the best way of, uh, of developing a minor, uh, players in a minor league system, Bill? Well, I, I probably started, accidentally started a wide-ranging discussion there that I, I can't follow through on, but the, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, from the, from the standpoint of the game as a whole, there would be huge advantages to restructuring the minor leagues so that the players were not sorted as belonging to teams. 
until they reached a much higher level. Okay, then then how would they be divvied up? The draft yeah. after? Sure. If, if suppose that you suppose that you had uh, uh, more or less the same assortment of leagues and that we have now, uh, but uh, players <laughs> did not belong to a team until they reached a, a certain. Most players, I mean, uh, quite exceptional talent. You're never going to get the get the major league teams to back off drafting the the. Uh, first round draft picks and controlling that from an early age. But most of the players could be could be just competing, trying to move up the ladder, and then when you get one or two years away, then there's a draft and you go on to a 40 man roster somewhere. The uh, and that, that you know, there are a lot of advantages to working it that way. For one thing, you wouldn't have teams constantly uh, uh, messing with minor league rosters you know, for their for the needs of the major league team. So that the minor league teams would be, the rosters would have more integrity, uh, and it would be easier for a minor league team to sell its product to the public uh, because you're not losing your star second baseman in the middle of the season because he's uh, because the the double A second baseman in the in the in the organization gets hurt and they need him up a level. Hmm. What do you think, Joe? Well, I, did, I I think it would be fascinating. Um, you know, I mean, in, in some ways, you're really bringing it back to the to the to the days. I mean, obviously, there was no draft at that time, but you're bringing it back to the days where, uh, you know, it was actually you know San Francisco uh, minor league team or, that signed Joe DiMaggio, and then and then the major league team had to go in and and you know try to try to get them from the minor league team. I mean, it, Bill has been talking about this for for a long time, and I think it's exactly right. It's the minor league experience is not nearly what it should be. For There's so many towns around the country that have baseball, but they don't really have a baseball team. They have a team that is driven by the, the major league team, by the major league needs. So if you have a really good pitcher and you, you go out to the game, you bring your kids, and the, you know, the, the guy is throwing six shutout innings and he's pitching great, and then he's not there in the seventh only because he's on a pitch count because of the major leagues, He's not really yours, you know. He's not really a part of your your community, a part of your town. He might get pulled out at any time. Um, it would be it would be better for baseball if there was great like connection to teams in all of the you know not just in in Cleveland and New York and Chicago, but in Des Moines and Omaha and 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 Austin. If there was that same connection to those teams, mm. the, the system that develops when each each individual follows his selfish needs uh, is often an inefficient system. Uh, the, uh, so, and this is just another example of it. The, the system that, that develops as a consequence of each team trying to fully uh, develop all of their own talent is, is uh, in, in many ways, it, it's parallel to the system that uh, to, to uh, systems that are developed in other areas from er from each each politician or each gas station following its own uh, and this is probably a bad example but but uh, there are a few things uglier than a, a franchise uh, strip right uh, the uh, a strip of of uh, two thousand franchise restaurants and other miscellaneous franchises and when you think about why that happens it's each one trying to get your attention creates a mess when they when you put it all together it's sort of the same thing when you, when everybody follows their own it's not that any anyone's saying let's build an ugly restaurant it's the the ugliness results from everybody competing for attention and you get similar problems in a lot of areas hmm. good stuff um, another th th something else you said yesterday bill that was uh, there was a bunch of things obviously that were, that were interesting but i'm i'm wondering uh, first, uh, you're saying lefty versus lefty, those platoon matchups that you look to um, exploit, take advantage of. Uh, you're saying you have to stretch to make them worth five runs a year? That's it? The, uh, uh, they're not, well, I don't, want to, I don't want to marry myself too deeply to a number because then somebody says, no, it's, it's eight runs, and then it looks like I've lost the, <laughs> uh, I've lost the whole argument because it's, it's eight runs rather than five. Even if it's eight runs, it's not worth it. The, uh, my, uh, my, I, I believe if if people study the issue, you will find that the cost of, and 
it's a complicated issue because there are great advantages to using pitchers in sprint mode rather than in, in marathon runner mode. And uh, we've moved to the uh, method that we use pitch relievers in now in large part to get those sprint mode advantages, right? And the, the left-handed, the use of frequent pitching changes uh, has, has the real and great advantage of putting more pitchers into sprint mode which is, is effective. My point is you can get that sprint mode value uh, while paying little attention to the left-right <coughs> percentages, and uh, it, it would be a lot more effective because you wouldn't have to, you could make the bullpen smaller, uh, and uh, by doing so, you could, you could have an extra pinch hitter, an extra outfielder, and get more, and, and I, I believe if you study it, you will find that the runs you gain by having, uh, by, I, I believe you'd find that the, that the, uh, the runs teams save by making 200 lefty to lefty switches a year don't begin to justify, and they're nowhere near justifying the cost of the expand of losing. Uh, utility infielders, losing. Earl Weaver used to have a, a left-handed catcher who'd bat 200 times a year and hit 12 homers. That type of player was worth more than, uh, than uh, uh, we're getting out of the, the lefty-lefty switches. So why isn't your team doing that? The, uh, uh, the, uh, <coughs> <laughs> there you go. My team is polite enough to listen to me, <laughs> uh, but it, it, it requires, you know, that there's a, there's a process you have to go through when to proving that things are true, and we haven't, that process, I've convinced myself that that's true, but at this point I haven't convinced anybody else. But if you use, yeah, use Earl Weaver, Casey Stengel did this, they'll buy it, you know? If you have to use it in those terms, that's what they understand. I, right? I, I think, <laughs> I, I really think this is, <clears throat> you know, this is what's the great search for what the next big inefficiency in baseball is. I think roster construction is a huge inefficiency in baseball. And I have a very specific example that I brought up to, to the Royals and I've written about. Uh, the Royals uh, this year have Jeff Francoeur in right field because they paid him a lot of money to be in right field, so he's going to be their right fielder. Jeff Francoeur is not an everyday baseball player, uh, certainly based on his career, um, especially, <laughs> especially last year. Um, so, but they have him, and they're going to pay him, and they need to use him. Now, they would be doing themselves, in my opinion, a great service, and they'd be doing Jeff Francoeur a great service if they basically tried to hit Jeff Francoeur against left-handed pitching, which he can hit, uh, gave him 300 at-bats a year, something along those lines, and brought up a minor leaguer or picked up a left-handed bat that they would give the other at-bats to, find a way to use those two guys. I think that adds many more. I don't think, I don't think it's even, it would even be, uh, I don't think you'd have to delve that deeply into the value to say that's much more valuable than a left-handed specialist, mm -hmm. the, the 12th guy in the bullpen. There's just, it's absolutely un, no question in my mind, but they'll get, they'll carry the 12th, hand, the 12th guy in the bullpen anyway, because the manager wants him, the manager's gonna get all upset, hey, everybody else has a left-handed specialist, I don't have one, there's gonna be times during the year where they're going to find themselves really bullpen strapped and they're going to go, oh my gosh, if we had that 12th man, uh, the first time they blow a save because they couldn't use the right guy because of that, then everybody in the media goes in. There's just a, there's a constant pressure downward to do uh, what everybody's doing. Right, that's right. It, it, there, it's, it's, you get criticized when you, when you do things in a different way and you can't reasonably expect people to, to uh, uh, accept that criticism and buy into that different way of, it's, it's really hard to change the way that baseball teams run. And, uh, and you can't expect the manager, you couldn't expect John Farrell to do that based on the fact that I think uh, <laughs> that it's more efficient. You, I mean, you have, to, you have to wait until there's a consensus one way or the other and then you can begin to move them. 
You wait for a consensus, then the, loop, the loophole is closed. You take advantage of the information when no one else is listening to it. Wouldn't that be the huge well, advantage? Somebody will be the first person to get there. But no. it, it, it's, just not, it's just not the way the system works that, that somebody comes up with an idea and immediately goes into development. There, there's a, uh, it doesn't, and it, if you believe that that's the way it's worked, then you don't really believe in science. No other, si no other scientific uh, uh, dominion works that way, and, and sabermetrics shouldn't work that way either. I wonder if in Houston they have an advantage then in that they are doing things drastically differently. Right. I have a lot of confidence that Houston's going to be a successful organization. I, I wish I'd been up here to a answer that question, because I said in five years they're going, to be, they're going to be winning 95 games a year. You just answered it. There you go. All right, so what, what, give us your thoughts on it but beyond that. No, I, I think... I think there, there are still, there's never going to be a shortage of ignorance. There's always going to be things that we do that are just totally illogical when you think about them. And if you get a group of smart people devoted to identifying and exploiting those weaknesses, there's plenty of room to succeed. Uh, and Houston's a big city with a lot of money, and uh, they're going to do great. Hmm. What do you think, Jeff? No, I totally agree. I think. It's, it's sort of like your idea of the, of the Knuckleball Academy. I don't think you could, if you were a GM of the Boston Red Sox, I don't know that you could say, okay, we're going to now open up our own Knuckleball Academy. But if you're a GM of the Houston Astros or a team that's really, really bad, maybe, you know, maybe you would. Maybe you could because you'd be in that situation where, you know, you, you can create a little, a whole new thing. Hey, we're, we're, we're breaking away from everybody else and we're trying something completely different. And that's what they're doing, and I think that puts you in the best position and best situation to to deal with all of that downward pressure that we're talking about. I think it, it puts them in a situation to try a lot of different things, and I think they're they've got a tremendous number of smart people, and and uh, and I think they have the the they're separated enough, and everybody's expectations of them is so low that I think they're in a great position to stay with it and try these things and. And, uh, and I agree with Bill. I think they're going to be a very good team. Wow. Yeah, I set the over under at 90, and so you're going over. I'm going that. over. That's interesting. That's right. Excellent. Um, I, as I'm sitting on these panels and I'm thinking of different things, and I don't know why it popped into my head as I was talking uh, you know, to our GM panel, but I really, it suddenly hit me, yeah, why are we managing the way we've managed all these years? Like, and is, it's in my mind because I talked to uh, the Rockies GM, Bill Guyvet. He had an office in the clubhouse. They actually asked me on MLB Tonight to come out and advocate for that because Mitch Williams and Joe McGrain shockingly did not want the GM in the clubhouse, <laughs> even though Joe McGrain didn't realize his GM was in the clubhouse. It was Whitey Herzog. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so I, why, why, why not? Wouldn't you want? I mean, <clears throat> I like, you know, at my office, the CEO <clears throat> actually wanders around and talks baseball with us. It's a good thing. Um, why wouldn't you want the GM there? And in other words, what, what's, the, what's the front office manager of the future and doesn't it, don't you lose that barrier and maybe the manager isn't one guy, you need a couple, it's an enormous job, you have a couple of guys, so maybe wade into that. What's, what is the integration of front office manager and how does that, uh, how would a progressive team handle that? The risk is that you undercut the manager by giving the players a, a very direct <coughs> pipeline uh, above, the risk is that you can weaken the manager's position at a time when you need the manager's position to be stronger. Uh, the, uh, and I would, if I was making a decision totally on my own, I think I'd honor that risk. Uh, and this, this goes back really to the 1925 Pirates. And, uh, the, uh, the, 19, in the 1925 Pirates, uh, and, and remember, the, the term general manager isn't used in 1925. The term general manager was introduced in 27. The, uh, 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 the uh, Branch Rickey is just developing the modern front office in St. Louis. Pittsburgh hired uh, an old and legendary manager named Fred Clark, who was an executive, but he sat in the dugout and, uh, and wore a suit. Uh, and. Uh, the result of that was that a huge conflict developed between the manager and the old manager who was sitting there. And a lot of the players were like half on the side of Fred Clark and the other half were on the side of, of the current manager. 
there was a, a huge blow up in August in the middle of a pennant race and the team drifted out of the pennant race. A team that probably should have been a dynasty uh, wound up as a very good team that won two or three pennants but wasn't quite a dynasty. And a principle was established that you don't put a front office man uh, in a suit in daily contact with the players and we still honor that and I would still honor it because I think it's too risky. Hmm. Um, well, here's the thing. I mean, I think this is, this is true across all of, all of sports. <clears throat> There's no one way to do it. There's no one correct, right way to do those things. I mean, I think in Oakland, I think it's, it's you know, Billy Bean pretty famously, you know, believes that the manager is a middle manager and that's a different environment and all that. Um, but in another place, uh, the manager is very, you know, it, it, they use it in a different way, and they, and they can both win. I mean, I think San Francisco looks at their manager very differently than Oakland does, but they're both very good teams last year. So I think there are a lot of different ways to do it. I, I, still, I'm, I still tend to believe that, that they're kind of two separate things in a lot of ways. I mean, not to say that the general manager uh, doesn't have direct impact on the team. Of course he does, uh, even during the season. But I think there's something to allowing a manager to, to be, to be to, this is your clubhouse and you run it. Not to say that you can just do whatever you want and you don't follow the philosophy of the club. Nobody's bigger than the club. But it's your clubhouse and, and it, sometimes you could go up to a player and say to them, look, you know, this is the way it is. I don't know that I agree with it or whatever, but, you know, hey, we're, this is how we're doing things. The way you do in, in real business, the way man, you know, management goes all across the board. So I don't know what the manager of the future looks like. I think there are going to be, there are going to be some real experiments along those lines, though. I mean, I do think you're seeing a little bit, a little bit of that. I mean, with the younger managers, with the Robin Venturas and, and some of these guys that were you know, pretty recently on the field, I think you're going to see more and more experiments along those lines. But I don't know that you're going to ever see, like, you know, I mean, the Cubs tried that school, you know, you know school college of, coach, of coaches, college of yeah. coaches yeah. and all of that, which was, you know, a fiasco. And, and, and so, you know, I think there's going to be experiments along those lines. But I think in general terms, I think there's still going to be a, a little bit of a separation in the clubhouse. The one thing to remember is that, and, and even, you know, Brandon McCarthy, who I think is on the very cutting edge of baseball players, th there's only so much he wants to know. I mean, he, he, he looked at the numbers and he studied them to try to get himself as a better player, but he'll be the first one to tell you. Um, there are a lot of stuff he doesn't want to know. He, there are a lot of numbers he doesn't want to get into. He doesn't want to think too much on the mound. He doesn't want to deal with too much of these things. Uh, he wants to sort of live in his world um, where he's comfortable. And I think most baseball players are like that. They're very young. Uh, they, they're, not, they're not in the game, you know, because they've been fans for 50 years, they're, they're in the game because they are really good at it. And, and I think you want to try to keep that development, um, you know, that's, that's, that's not the same thing as saying, you know, as, as some of the, the analytical stuff that I think everybody does. See, I'm really torn because uh, the more I hear people talk about this and I hear that, uh, you know, I'm talking to Larry Bowen, we're doing top 10 managers right now, and, and he says, well, it's really three jobs. And I'm thinking, well, then why not get three guys? It makes sense to me. Yet at the same time, I know Bill. One thing you said to me: we were lunch. Bill James and I were lunching at the Say Hey Cafe, and he, Bill James <laughs> told me this. <clears throat> I like dropping that in now and then. Uh, but we were we were sitting there, and you said because now everything I know I'm advocating is: hey, get bigger, get bigger, get more of a system, get more of a machine in place, uh, but an intelligent machine. And yet, uh, most of the great things we see come from the vision of one person who has the power to actually put it through. And Bill, one thing you said to me was uh, that you don't want to get so big that you can't move. Uh, right. What are your thoughts on what's the most effective way to have an organization? Well, I think a strong, I, I, I do think it's three jobs, but I think that, that you want the other two guys reporting to the manager. The, uh, uh, and, and I do think we're drifting slowly, inc incrementally in that decision, in that, in that direction. Uh, pitching coaches are given a little more, you know, pitching coaches run pitching staff to an extent. Uh, the, and I think we are, we, are, we are going in that direction. 
What are, what are the three what are the three jobs? Hmm? What are the three oh, jobs? Oh, I don't you know, I'm making that up. Look, it's club, running the clubhouse, uh, in-game strategy, and I forget the other one. I don't know, whatever. You know, it's uh, this, you've got to run the game, you've got to have kind of a, a grand your grand strategy, your uh, you know, on point strategy, you know, your minute to minute decisions, and the rest is, you know, running the clubhouse in a leadership manager capacity. Keeping guys happy, loose, communicating the whole thing. I don't, I mean, I, I see that, but I mean, that's oh, like dealing with the media. That's the other one. Well, yeah. and, and this is, this is my point. I mean, you know, I could say my job is three jobs. I write and then I <coughs> send it in and then I <laughs> listen to the editor. So, you know, I mean, I, it's three jobs, but I, I mean, you, you can't have, the manager has to deal with the media, right? He can't say, okay, well, we'll just have a media person go in there and do that. I mean, you could. But you would be losing a lot of, you know, the your connection to the fans and connection. To I think it's way too much for one guy. I think it's, it's, it's way too much for one. Guy. But I just don't see how would you split it up? I mean, you would say you're in charge of the clubhouse, like to somebody. Yeah, have an in-game strategist. Yeah, have have a manager who's like your CEO, your college president, your fundraiser, the guy, you know, your Bobby Bowden. Hey, everybody, and then you have a guy who's actually running the. So, running so you would show, do it like football. So, like yeah. you would have an offensive and defensive coordinator. Yeah, and you do already do. Like yeah, the pitching coach, he's your defensive coordinator. The, the bench, the bench coach is a much more prominent position now than it was 10, 15 years ago. So yeah. it might. So you think it'll keep becoming more prominent, yeah. the bench coach? Yes. So will the bench coach? Yeah, there, that's a great question then, and I'd ask you two guys. I'll take the moderator off. <laughs> I want it. Um, will the bench coach become an analytical guy? Will the bench coach yeah. of the future be somebody in this It'll room? It'll be a, look just like that kid there. Right. That's will, the kid. Will that happen? Kid, yeah. <laughs> will that happen? I, that's what I'm getting at when you and the players were saying to me, my, the ex-players that are at MLB Network are saying, I can't have some guy from the front office sitting there next to me. And I'm like, why wouldn't you want that information? You would want it from Joe Madden. You would want it from Whitey Herzog. You got it from every good skipper that used to have to remember it in his head, now you actually have the actual information. And the kid, as he's often referred to in, in Major League Baseball, would actually be there, your assistant GM, to feed you the information. Yeah, that's, that's your analytics guy. And everybody's on the same page. He's not like running behind your back, the manager's back, and stabbing him in the back. Everybody supposedly should be on the same page. Right. Right. There you go, we've solved it. That's right. <laughs> I think eventually it, it will get to that, where you'll have that uh, an assistant GM down there, and I would think the, nobody from the Rays here would raise their hand, but I think it seems like that's what they keep talking about, that wh give me as much information as possible, and wouldn't you want that right at your fingertips at all times? Well, how long is it until that, that, uh, that uh, young guy is a young girl? There you go. Yeah, tomorrow. I mean, there's no reason, there's no reason why not. I, I think it would be great. I, I think that, and you have a bench coach uh, the certain position that is the bench coach now. And I look around the league at bench coaches and, and, and that is their job, essentially, is to, is to whisper in the, co the manager's ear, right. here are the odds, here are the percentages. But, you know, I look around the league and I look at a lot of the bench coaches and I'm like, that guy doesn't think any differently than the manager. I mean, he's, he's, he is the manager, essentially. I mean, the, the Dodgers coach is Don Matt, manager is Don Mattingly. Their bench coach is Trey Hillman, who is the Royals manager. And I, I, I covered Trey for a long time. Trey's a very smart baseball guy, but Trey's not saying anything different than, than what Don Mattingly's thinking. Well, they have the wrong guy there. Well, I that's mean, what I mean. It's, but it's, I'm saying that could be somebody in this yeah. room. Right, but he's able to concentrate. Uh, Don, I mean, right. the, uh, and I bet a lot of you have found this even coaching. You're coaching eight-year-old kids, and you're in the game. It's amazing how much faster that game is moving when you're in it than it is when you're watching it. And, and uh, just to Don Mattingly, there's so many things going on uh, that the, that he's not able to focus on the issue of exactly when should I get up the, the left-handed reliever to start warming up in the bullpen and waste some of the resources of the team. The, uh, uh, and, and getting somebody who, <laughs> somebody who can concentrate on when you do want to make that illogical move uh, is, uh, it's, not that, it's not that he's smarter than the other guy, it's just that you need somebody who can concentrate on it. But he should be smarter than the other guy. I'm just saying that there should, if, if you're doing that, that's exactly, I totally agree with all of that. And I think then that person should be a fully trained bench manager, a fully trained, not, right. not a former Absolutely. player yeah. necessarily, right. but like I say, somebody who's fully trained in, hey, it's time for you to get that. You know, you see this in college basketball all the time. Like you have these great college basketball coaches, but 
it's always the third guy down that goes, coach, he's got three fouls. You know what I mean? Because right. they can't follow that. <clears throat> right, you know, right. They can't follow all of that. Because even right. a smart manager is right, concentrating on other things where the other guy can be start, you know, without the pressure of the moment to moment, you start thinking sixth, seventh, eighth inning, what are we gonna do? How does he feel? Did he have the flu today? Did he wake up late? Did he get here late? How is he throwing? When is the last time he threw? How many pitches did he throw? And that, you know, I'm saying it's too much for one guy. Right. Too so, much. Hey, I, I can hear you broadcasting a game in the future. Yeah, the new bench coach has graduated the Stratomatic Academy. <laughs> <laughs> what if champion, 12 straight seasons? <laughs> Maybe we will. All right, I, I'll try to get some questions here in a second. Let me, though, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up what is going to happen in the next few years with the Hall of Fame and the voting and the backlog and all of that. We've written a lot. I know we've done a ton of it, but I, I, I want to get your thoughts, especially given all the big names that are coming and how that will be dealt with. What do you think happens, Bill? The, uh, I, we're, we're heading into a, uh, what has always happened at the Hall of Fame is that the voting structure gets, the, pri the uh, you should have warned me this question was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I should have, thought that, should, should have thought I had to plan this out. The, um, the front door of the Hall of Fame, the primary voting structure, they never, they never really change. It's basically the same as it's always been. Now what happens is that, is that every few years, the selections resulting from the primary system, the front door, get so messed up that they have to try to fix it, and they always try to fix it by fixing the back door. And they always think, well, we can't. And, and so they change the rules on the back door all the time. Well, what's going to happen in the next 10 years is that the, the process, as represented by the front door, is going to get more seriously screwed up than it ever has been uh, before as a consequence of two things. One is the, the steroids debate and the lack of clear thinking about that issue. And the other is um, the delayed effects of expansion. The effects of expansion on the Hall of Fame don't really hit until about 45 years later. It takes a long, long, long time to get from expansion to the point at which expansion is affecting the Hall of Fame. But the result of that is going to be that there's a backlog of candidates and when you get uh, the, the nature of the front door selection for the Hall of Fame is that if you get, if you get, uh, if there are five good candidates, four of them will be elected, but if there are 20 equally good candidates, none of them will be elected. And we're going to go through this period where it's very, very hard to get anybody in, and obviously qualified Hall of Fame candidates are going to be left out, and they'll have, and they'll try to fix it by fixing the back door again. Hmm. Joe? Um, Greg Maddox will get elected. <laughs> I'm saying that. That's it, my predict, my only prediction. <laughs> um, no, it's, it, it, Bill's exactly right. You know, I kind of came in to all of this these next few years thinking that here's what would likely happen, that, that they, there would be a punishment period of time for Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens, three or four years, two years, maybe even one year. There'd be a period of time that there'd be a punishment. You don't deserve to go in for his ballot, whatever. But eventually they would get voted in. The borderline guys that, that, that are connected to steroids would not get voted in and would be the, the, the cause of, of people down the road, and that people who are not really connected to the steroids in any real you know, logical way other than whatever you might have in your mind would, would get elected. You know? So I thought Mike Piazza was going to get elected, for instance. Um, it's, it's, it's not gone the way I thought it was going to go. And, and the way I look at it now is I don't think Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds will get elected anytime soon. Um, I, I don't see a 75% consensus on those two guys coming uh, at any point. And I'm not sure their numbers are dramatically going to even go up next year. I mean, they got in the, what, 38 40% range this year. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I could predict either one will get 50% next year or the year after. I think that there's, instead of, instead of sort of a gradual sort of removal from it, I think we, we're sort of still in the mud on, on the whole steroid issue. So uh, there's going to be a backlog. I think certain guys are going to get in. Maddo Maddox really will get in. He'll get 98%, 97% of the vote. I think that Tom Glavin and Frank Thomas are both going to get in. I, uh, people disagree with me on that. But I think they're both going to get elected. That's three. That probably doesn't leave room for anybody else. But BGO was so close last year that he might get in. I don't know if there's ever been four elected in the same year. Maybe yeah, it was like once in maybe like once the other something yeah. 55 I think. So yeah. so basically that leaves everybody else out. 
and then you go to the next year and there's a bunch of new guys going in. And I think the, the ones that it really hurts for me are the ones that we should be having the real discussion about, which is, you know, Kurt Schilling, Mike Bucin is coming up, um, guys like that that I think are Hall of Famers, but th nobody's even talking about them because you're talking again and again and again about Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. So I think it's going to be a mess for a long time. From a wider perspective, I would throw this yeah, in. Right, I'm right, sitting right. In, in my office, I'm watching MLB Network, and I'm looking up, and as we're talking steroids and everything else, there's an ad with a guy putting on underarm deodorant testosterone. Sure. It's a commercial for a guy just putting testosterone into his system. While we're saying, you can't put testosterone into your system. No, you're selling testosterone. I've, it's a, what, I, this cannot stand, right? I've, I mean, I've, the, the, to me, the, the one that's always been has been like the Viagra and, the, and those commercials. I mean, that's performance enhancing to the nth degree, right? I mean, <laughs> hey now. And it's, and it's, <laughs> it's not just, it's a billion dollar business and it's, you cannot escape it. It's inescapable. Mm -hmm. And, if you use Viagra without a, uh, without a prescription, it's illegal in the same way that, that steroids is. I mean, it's, it's, it's not so different, and yet it's viewed so differently. And, and I, don't, I don't think that can stand, but it is standing longer than I thought it would to now. I mean, I, I, like I said, I don't, see, I don't see even the slightest shift in, in any kind of more open-minded thinking about it. And I also don't see any kind of shift on looking back at that time period and realizing that no matter how you want to play it out, it wasn't the same then. There was no testing. There was no talk about it. There was no, there was no downward pressure at all. In fact, I think there was significant pressure within the organizations, you know, to, to, to compete. So I, I, think it's a, I think it's a real shame, but I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, I, I, agree, I agree with what of that I understood. The, uh, and, uh, Me too. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but it may be that we can't reach the point of rethinking this until uh, we've ground all of the steroids out of the game. Uh, I mean, when we reach a point, and the, and the steroids are are 99% gone from baseball, but but the there's going to be something else, and there's going to be some other. And, and we have to reach a sort of point of closure with that argument before we're able to get past the self-righteousness and the uh, uh, pretense that so far has dominated the steroids and Hall of Fame discussion. You think only 1% of players are using steroids now? Uh, less than 1%. Really? Yeah. Wow. They're gone. They're gone? They're gone? Uh, this, the testing pretty much works. Joe? Bill's in baseball. I don't know if you knew this, Bill. So yeah, I, I yeah, trust, yeah. I trust every single thing Bill ever says. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't know if it's 1%. I do think that, I think that there's – look, I think that's testing. I think the extreme cost you have to pay to take them is, is – is, it's certainly significantly less. I don't know if it's, if it's completely gone like that. I think there's still people who can game the system. I don't, there's still people that, can, that are going to cheat and going to get away with it, whatever. But – the, there's a huge cost now, which there wasn't in 1999. There's a huge opportunity and incentive to use and get in and get paid. Right. Well, there, there are people doing other things. I mean, there, there, are, people, there are lots of, uh, I mean, the big thing now is testosterone injections. Uh, or oh, so you weren't including that? No, I wasn't including testosterone. testosterone oh, is, okay. Is, is, is talking about purely steroids. <laughs> oh, no, I'm talking about all sorts of, yeah, testosterone, yeah. hormones, everything. The, the testosterone use is, uh, is, is a growing problem in Major League Baseball, having been badly burned by being roughly 40 years behind the curve on the last problem, is trying to stay on top of this one. And, and right. uh, I think I hope it'll make some progress. Right. Okay. Uh, well, let's get some questions here for Ken. Rob and I are right there. Um, well, I'm fascinated by this the expansion of, of coaches over the last 15, 20 years, and um, I think it won't be long before most players have individual coaches because the cost-benefit analysis probably suggests that if the player wants one, you might as well do it. The money's going to be so big. But getting back to the, the talk about the bench coaches, um, it seems to me that and I agree, Bill, that, that uh, even if you manage a little league game, things get away from you and you just miss things and it's nice to have somebody else helping. But it seems to me that with bench coaches in the game now and giving the managers that help, we should be able to go back retrospectively and say yes, they're making better moves today than they did 30 or 40 years ago, looking at the play-by-play. -play. And I'm just wondering 
if you guys think that that's even a viable approach, is managing, are managers doing a better job now than they were in 1965? Well, to re return to a theme, there'll never be a shortage of ignorance. And we're doing di different stupid stuff now than we did 40 years ago. <laughs> I, I think you could, e I, I think it's really, there's a really good study in there. Uh, and uh, not to pick on, Spark on, on Sparky Anderson, in the 1975 World Series, uh, Sparky Anderson intentionally walked, uh, I forget who it is, uh, uh, light hitting second baseman in order to pitch to Cecil Cooper. Uh, and I don't think you would see that now. Uh, I, I think there's a, there's a certain range of, of silly moves that are archaic, and I think you could, could demonstrate that uh, managers no longer do this that didn't make any sense. Uh, I, I, I think that it's not one good study, but really a lot of really good studies that you could do showing situations in which managers bunted totally irrationally and probably cost their teams uh, the uh, Canada or World Series, and, and but that doesn't mean that we're not doing equally stupid stuff now. It's just different stupid stuff. What do you think, Joe? Um, I think there are plenty of irrational moves now. I don't know that the managers are are doing any better now. You know, there's there's a lot of things about the game that change, and and one thing that I've found fascinating is that teams now with the with closers and high paid prices, and teams are not winning a higher percentage of games that they go into the ninth inning leading than they did in the 1950s. In the 1950s and now, teams that led going into the ninth inning by X number of runs or whatever, are winning at exactly the same clip, or almost exactly the same clip. We're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to get these guys out in the ninth inning when you, the old days you would have the tired old, you know, Jim Bunning uh, getting, the, getting guys out at the same percentage and getting, getting wins at the same percentage. Now, why is that true? And people say, well, it's changed. Baseball is more offensive now. You have to do it. If, if, you, if you went back to the old way, you would, you would lose at a much higher clip. That might be true. I mean, I think there's an evolving nature. I don't think that when you compare managers to today to, them, to, to, to the league that, there's, that they're any less, ira you know, less irrational. I think they they're probably are as rational, but I do think, agree with Bill, I don't think they bunt nearly as much as they used to. I don't think they do a lot of the things that they used to do. Um, so in some ways, they would look smarter. But I think, you know, compared to league norms, I think they're just as irrational as ever. Uh, I would think they'd be much smarter. Front offices are much, much smarter now, oh, right? No, we're not. <laughs> no? <laughs> we, look at the we, free agent class that comes out every year. It stinks now. It used to be very good. You let guys go all the time. Not you, but other people would let guys go every year. Well, it's nice of you to accept me from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was not you. You were writing about it. <laughs> uh, let's get to some other questions. I'm hogging things. Yes. Either one. I want to, uh, glad you asked the question, and I, I think Bill would be more specific to answer that, but I did want to bring up a, a, Bill, a Bill James idea that I think uh, has great merit and one that I think we should see down the road. We're getting, they're getting so much better, you know, as far as, as far as using various camera angles and everything to determine what a batter's strike zone is, and obviously we see it on TV with the various strike zones. I think there has to become a time where Home plate umpires will be wearing an earpiece, in, the, in the, you know that they'll have on that will beep when a strike comes, and it won't be for the. They don't have to use that kind of the way the way tennis has a as a, a you know a beep when when the serve is is a little bit off or a little long. You can overrule that. You don't have to. You know it's it's up to the it's up to the line judge whether or not to to say that that's a, the right thing. But it's a tool that they use, and I think it's a tool that would bring tremendous consistency. Maybe we're not there yet. Maybe we're not there on the, on the laser you know, technology of what a strike zone is, but we're getting there and we're gonna get there. And I think that's a big part, because I think right now 
there are advantages to knowing, hey, I mean, you hear it in the clubhouse all the time. Oh, this guy's, you know, behind the plate today. He's got a huge strike zone or, or you know, you better swing early because this guy, you know, he's going to punch you out or whatever. So they do look at those trends. That's, I think that's silly, though. I mean, it's, it shouldn't be that way. It should be a much more consistent thing. And I think with the tools that are coming out, um, I, I think that's going to have to happen. You know, one thing to, to, answer you, to answer your question, the uh, uh, different first base, third base umpires are widely inconsistent in how they call the check swing strike. Uh, major league teams are aware of that. And uh, under certain conditions, the starting pitcher will be aware that that first base umpire likes to call the, will call this the strike because if you throw a slider down the way, people will start to swing at it, they'll check the, their, uh, their swing and uh, it's really important whether that that's an umpire that tends to call that a strike or tends not to call it a strike. So yeah, we're, we're aware of that stuff and we watch it and, and, and uh, I would bet almost every team is on top of that issue. You know, there's there's something about that, by the way, that seems to have changed over the last couple of years, because for a while there, with the check swing, you would see that, you'd all, and you still do, you see that angle from first base to see whether they cross the plate, you know, whether they broke whatever, uh, some plane. And then, uh, and for me, it was really only like a year or two ago, everybody started talking about, no, 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 it's all whether you had the, the whether you intended to swing. Right. It's like a judgment call, which to me is such a cop-out. That's like, that's like pass interference in football. It's like it's a judgment call, mm -hmm. which means I can't ever be wrong. I, I think there should be a defined thing on what a check swing well, is. Of course you were intended on swinging, and then you intended to not swing. Well, what did you I mean, do? Right. But, but, <laughs> exactly. But even this is an intent, you know? Yeah. I mean, so I don't know what the, you know, the full intention of swinging is, but that rule seems to be very convoluted. I, I want to get, uh, is Jeff Miller here? I know who did the, the Making Intangibles Tangible. I love his psychological uh, <laughs> test on every time you heard a beep, would you just uh, have all the response, beep, strike, beep, strike. I mean, well, of course you would just automatically hear I, the beep and you'd react, strike. I got to be honest with you, though, that would make 95% of umpires better. So that's so, what you're yeah. doing. You're automating no, no, your robot I, umpiring. I don't, I don't think so. I think you train them to say, hey, you're, you, are doing this, you are doing this in a defined way. Hey. You do this. I mean, how many times do you have to talk where you have an earpiece on and somebody's talking in your ear? Yeah, all day long. Right? right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes us crazy. Yes. No, of course, of course, absolutely. Other question? Right there, yes, John. Yeah, hi. Um, so my personal theory about the closer, all right, and I will see what you guys think of this. Um, I'm sure it's been said out there also, but um, the closer is your best pitcher in a short term. It's you've been determined to be the guy that is going to get the most crucial outs in the ninth inning. And, you know, a lot of times the most crucial outs are in the ninth inning. But if he's your best pitcher, you sh my theory is, yes, save him for the ninth, but if there's that situation in the sixth where you got the bases loaded and there's or two men on and, and nobody out, bring in your best pitcher to get those guys out and tell him. You know, it's a mentality thing, right? The closer is a mentality thing. You're my closer because you have the mentality to get the guys out when I need them to, to be gotten out. And you tell them that, hey, it's sometimes going to be in the sixth inning, and it's sometimes going to be in the seventh inning. Why, why wouldn't they do that? Or should they do that? Maybe, maybe my thinking's wrong. Maybe they are doing it. The, uh, 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 it's always risky to talk about anything that's happening with the Red Sox because it gets out. But I guess it's uh, when Terry was with us, Terry definitely regarded Daniel Bard as more valuable than, than Papelbon, and he wanted to keep Bard in that for a, at one period of time when Pap, when Pap wasn't, you know, Pap's a great pitcher, one of the greatest closers. I mean, he's, you go through the history of baseball, you don't find many, many pitchers as, as effective as Papelbon for as long a period of time. The, uh, but Bar, he thought Bard was actually more valuable because he could, you know, he could bring Bard, he was more flexible. He was, in, the, in, the, in his, in a, he was, he had more 
flexibility to use Bard at the moment when he, when he needed him. So I think that that is happening. I think you do see teams who have a closer who's, it's, you know, it's like a member of the royal family. It's a ceremonial position. Uh, but the, the, real, <laughs> the real key asset is the guy that you're free to deploy where you most need him. Yeah, I, and I think that the one thing about the, the, the closer at this point, I don't even think the people, you know, and, and this really feeds off of what Bill was saying, I don't think almost anybody views the closer as their best pitcher. I think they view their closer as the ninth inning guy. That's it. It's that, that's, that's the job. It's, you know, but the, what, the, what the Yankees. But if he is the best pitcher, then aren't you wasting him if you don't read? Yes, the absolutely. But, but he's going to get paid a lot more to be the closer. So, <laughs> so you know, he's going to want to be the closer anyway. It doesn't matter. Yeah, of course it is. You know, the Yankees, I, I've always thought it's fascinating with the Yankees, how they'll pitch Mariano Rivera in the postseason compared to how they pitch him in the regular season. Postseason, two on in the eighth inning, he's, he's coming in. You know, they, 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 they they understand that his value is not starting the ninth inning clean all the time in a short period of time. But over a season, he's still the, the vast, vast, vast majority of the time that Mariano Rivera comes in, it'll be ninth inning, three runs or less, precisely the save rule. I mean, that's just how it goes. I think that's how people view the closer now. Uh, I think it's an inefficiency. Uh, I think there's something that should be... You know, staggering inefficiency, yeah. I, well, <laughs> and you know how you change it? You change it by paying Daniel Bard more than you pay your closer, right? right? I mean, that's how that's you... That's starting to happen. I mean, we're, It is starting yeah, to happen yeah. somewhat, but it's not... Yeah. It, it's going to be a while. Guys, I, I trot out in, in the play all the time, just bring out, uh, you know, we bring out video from the 70s, and I just start looking, and it's like, when did, when did Goose Gossage come in? When did Sparky Lyle come oh, in? And was, yeah. Wasn't the fo relief ace just much more efficient in the so, 70s? And I don't know the exact time it was frame. Calling him a, it was calling him a fireman. Yeah. I think that's when it changed. They just call him fireman again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, right there. That's you. We have done that. There, that's been done with several innovations. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a good idea. The, 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 the real issue, I think, is that winning is such a low priority for the low minor leagues and for middle minor leagues. I mean, it's, you know, some of the things we're talking about is how to squeeze more wins out of your team. Uh, I mean, teams care to an extent. They want their, team, their players to be part of a winning team. But generally speaking, they're, they're in it for development. They're not in it for, you know, winning the first half pennant. And, and so I think... In some ways, you could try a lot of these things, and it would be great, but I don't know if you would come up with a lot of answers because at the end of the day, it's still, it's still about developing players and not as much about you know, winning, which I think is a, is a real shame for the minor leagues. And, and to get, that's right. To get back to the idea I was talking about earlier, if, if, you, didn't, if you didn't have teams assigned to organizations uh, earlier, you would have more freedom to get committed minor league pennant races where there's a real focus on winning. I, I, think, it, I think it's very difficult to sell a product uh, where – players don't care about winning. And you go to minor league games and you know that this is not that much focus on winning because things aren't done in the way they would be done if there was a big focus on winning. And it makes it very hard to sell the product. You know, I joked about the room and I'm gonna, in sabermetric fashion now, well, who have I selected for, for, for questions? The, only the people I see right here yeah, in this picture. Go. Let's All widen the lens. Oh wait, I'm gonna go deep. Yes, right there. Hi. Uh, I had a real bias toward this side of the room and I apologize, go ahead. I don't think uh, any idea has been discussed more during the conference than this Knuckleball Academy, and I have two uh, questions about that. One, do you think that we're kind of falling prey to a survivor bias because we're only seeing the very, very cream of the crop in terms of knuckleballers? I recall a number of prospects who tried to become knuckleballers and failed. And two, isn't there a game theory aspect where hitters would start to adjust if uh, a team was rolling out knuckleballers constantly? Uh, wouldn't that lower the value of the academy significantly? Well, the, uh, this discussion is driven by this fact, that knuckleballers throughout history have always been more effective than numerous. I mean, there's, there's there was one knuckleballer starting in the National League last year, and Zari Dickey. Uh, his name would be more interesting if it was Rad Dickey, by the way. The, the, uh, uh, the, uh, 
Uh, but it, there, there are a lot of years like that. There have been a lot of years where there was only one knuckleballer in the league, and it was Phil Necro, and he was like one of the three best pitchers in the league. So when you have that situation where there's a one subgroup is, you know, if, if left-handed pitchers were much more effective than right-handed pitchers, it would drive the population to more left-handed pitchers, right? When relievers are more effective than starters, it drives the game toward more use of relievers. For some reason, uh, knuckleballers have been more effective than non-knuckleballers for a long time, and it has never driven the population toward more knuckleballers, and that creates a, a, an anomaly that we keep trying, because we're logical people, <laughs> we keep trying to resolve logically, and it's, it's, it, uh, we can't quite get there. By the way, I think both excellent points. I think you're right, and you're right, to what degree, I don't know. You know, they say Mickey Mantle threw an incredible knuckleball, right? That nobody would even play catch with him on the sideline, uh, on the side. Because Wade Boggs, too, right? Through, yeah. Why, why didn't they do that? Why didn't they? I, I mean, don't Mickey know. Mantle, I mean, you know, like, you know, I'm retiring, but now I'm a knuckleball pitcher. Right. I mean, <laughs> how awesome would that be? Yeah. Yeah. Extremely awesome is it the answer. Awesome. Yes. Uh, awesome. Let me stay on this side of the room. Yes. Somebody's working on numbers. Um, my question to you is, how big of an advantage do you think a team can get moving from an average analytic staff to an elite analytic staff? I think you don't want to be behind the curve. Uh, that's as much as I can tell you. I, th I think it's huge. I think there are huge, huge inefficiencies in the game, and I think there always will be. And I think finding those. Now, it, it, one of the, the real problems um, is it, it's not like you have like, you know, in, the, in, in baseball, like if you're, if you're a, a, a good team and then you have a bunch of minor leaguers and, and you, you expect them to fill in, it's not like one great idea is gonna be like, well, you have 12 in reserve that you're gonna be able to use later, you know? Um, you, you keep trying and keep developing and you, you come across things that, that are gonna work and maybe work and you can actually get them across to people and, and you can get some consensus on them and then you can try them. That's a very long and difficult process. I think, I really believe this, there are brilliant, brilliant people working uh, in analytics throughout baseball right now who have come up with incredible ideas, much smarter than, than anything that, that I think is in the public domain, um, or, or at least as smart as some of the great things in the public domain, and they're not being used because it's difficult to get that consensus. So to me, it's not just having the people who come up with the ideas. It's having the people that can express those ideas in a way that they can really convince an organization to be a part of it. But by and large, Joe, don't you think now that, I mean, we're in the business of this, like, let's cultivate and list and rank the stupid moves of the offseason. And it's a much smaller list. I mean, it's hard work now to find the bad moves. It used to be I, I a lot think, easier. I don't think you could convince Bill no, that the Boston really? Red Sox made a lot of great moves the last three years. Right? Wait, what are you saying exactly? I'm saying He's the Boston Bill, Red Sox I happen to have Bill James really, right here. He's right here. <laughs> Bill's not going to disagree with me. Wait. I mean, the, the Boston Red Sox were the very cutting edge of technology and, 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 and analytics and, and brilliant, and they won for consistently, and then they went through a stretch of time. Nobody could argue that Carl Crawford and, and, and uh, John Lackey and some of these other moves at were the at the as time bad they, as any mo team has uh, made. At the time they were made, you thought that, did you say they were terrible at that moment they made them? They're terrible now. No, no, but at the moment, you, you can't look back three years when you're making yeah, but, them at the moment. Uh, you yeah. could, some, I defended the lackey of, move. I thought it made sense. I, I really did. It did. So, some of them were terrible moves at the time we made them, yes. The, uh, and, and we should have known better. Yeah. I, I, and, and anyway, I think that's just a general thing. I mean, I'm sure there were probably people that when, when the Cubs uh, traded Brock for Brolio said, well, at the time, it was a good move. I mean, it, it, time will determine whether or not it's a good move. I think people are making as good moves and as bad moves as they ever have. But, but Adrian Gonzalez is a, you know, you look at the metrics where he's coming from in a pitcher's park and he's still in his 20s and what first basemen are getting paid. Uh, I thought that was a kill shot for, for the Red Sox. I thought but, that was a But it didn't great, turn out that way. I, but at the, when you're making that move, that's, but that's a, my there, point. there's some basis to make that move. But that's my, well, of course there's basis to make all those moves, but that's my point. The limitations <laughs> of, of everything 
suggest that just because something makes sense doesn't mean it's a good move. Yeah. Bill is sitting here going, I'm sitting right here. You know, all right. <laughs> no, well, I, 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 can't, I can't come that Dutch, Listen, this is a good I'll TV show, that. huh? We could do a good show somewhere. Take it on the road, Bill. Thank you. We've gone over. I've gotten the, the, the kill sign already, but uh, it, it's been a super panel. Thanks to Joe Posnanski and, of course, Bill James. Thank you, everybody.